They'd like to welcome you to our oral history that continues for Somerset. Today we have David Plurin. said she wasn't going to talk much, but we got to try to get her into it. And they're going to talk about some of the history of the family, which goes back into the early 1800s with Joe the first. So with that, we'll start with the history in a little bit. Okay. Well, just going back a little bit, um, did some, some digging and went back a little farther than that, Harold. Went back to 1573 with a fellow by the name of Louder. Okay. Went back to 1573 by a, with a fellow by the name of Rene de Plure, and then it says parentheses D I T Plure from France. And he had a son by the name of Francis in 1574. Just to kind of put it in perspective, um, you know Columbus was here in. 1492, um, the French explorer Carter was, Cartier I guess it would be called, 1530, so that was about, you know, not too far after that. Um, then from there there was 1603, there was Pierre Plourd, he was in France. 1635, uh, Francis Plourd in France. And then 1675, a René Plourd. And uh, Quebec was founded in 1663. Actually, 1608, and in 1663, French, or Quebec was taken over as New France. And in 1695, Francis Plurd went to uh, just south of Quebec, in the I think it's pronounced. Uh, need some French-speaking people here, but uh, uh, Rival Quail in Canada, and that's where the family settled in 1695. <laughs> and from there, he had a son, um, well, René also, who was born in France, uh, died in 1697. And then in 1701, there was a Pierre, in 1708, an Augustine, 1746, a Dennis, and 1756, another Augustine. Um, well, actually, Augustine died in 1756. And the interesting thing about that, right in the precise area that they lived in is where there was a tremendous amount of the French Indian Wars. Um, there's a book out recently called White Devil and it talked about the battles going back and forth during that time frame and when I trace back into the family history they lived right in that very area and all those little French communities had, had uh, a census that they took and we go back and you take a look and you open it up and it looks like the Somerset phone book from about 1960. <laughs> oh, it did. Wow. It, it, was, it was amazing. Each of those little communities had a, had a census. And, uh, but they were right in the middle of the, of the ugliest and the worst mm -hmm. local fighting uh, between, the, between the French, Indians, and the British at the time. And it was, there was a, a fort called Fort Francis, I think, right nearby there that was basically a massacre. And this was right in, from what I could tell, 10, 20 miles or so from where all this happened. So those, those people all saw a lot of things in Quebec that, you know, like we see or hear about today in Lebanon and in the Middle East. So they kind of lived in that same, unfortunately, they lived in that same environment when they left. You know, why would they leave? Well, I think there's a pretty good reason. <laughs> yeah, really. Um, and then in, uh, let's see, in... There's a bunch, it goes all the way down through the genealogy here, but in 1863, Edward Plurd, this is Edward I, um, operated a flour mill in St. Pacom in Canada, and he had done that for 20 years. So from 1863 to 1883, he ran a flour mill in Canada, right outside of Quebec. <coughs> he moved to Canada in or I moved from Canada to Stillwater actually in 1883. And they stayed in Stillwater for about a year and then in 1884 moved to Somerset. In 1884 they bought the mill from Sam Harriman which was underneath the which you know today if you look at the pictures um, one of the pictures really shows it well with the new bridge picture. If you look at the new bridge picture or the old bridge picture and look off to the left side, there was a big grist mill and power, well, a grist mill there, basically. Mm. And then there was a pretty big head of water that went so the apple 
from the where the new bridge is today upriver was probably I don't know, 20 feet plus deep, or maybe Anna. Well, it's, but anyway, it was deep back in that time. Um, they ran the mill, then the family, from from about uh, till about 1897. So they ran it for about 15 years. And then they sold it to a fellow doctor from New Richmond. And he installed, yeah, right in here. Okay. If you look, if you look at this picture, to get it in perspective, if you look at this picture, this is the, if you went straight down I, mm -hmm. past Harry Delsa's in the corner. Oh, maybe. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So straight down, this was the old original bridge that crossed the Apple. And off to the left here, you can see the power dam. Actually, it wasn't the power dam at the time, it was the grist mill. So Sam Harriman built that and then sold that to my great-great-grandpa. And then his, his family worked that. Um, what's interesting in this picture that I'd never known before is that when the water was that high, there are houses down over the bank. So if you're crossing the new Apple River Bridge, it would be down on the, as you're crossing on the right-hand side, on the east side of the river, there were, there were homes along the You can see uh, the, the lower foundation bank. still there. The parts oh, of yeah. Them. Yes, you can see yeah. them. Mm -hmm. there's, there's, a, mm -hmm. there's a lot of uh, rock and stuff against the wall. So it almost looked like landscaping at the time. So, so that was well taken care of back in there. Here's another photo from yep. the other side. Mm -hmm. that, uh, my great-grandfather ran the mill for, for, Reverend, for Mr. Harriman. Did he? OK. Oh. Yep. Oh yeah, that is a good yeah. picture. What a... So, and this leads up to something on the tubing, actually, what it does in some ways. <laughs> but uh, then this a fellow from from New Richmond, this doctor, I think it's Epi, he converted it to a Epley. 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 Mm -hmm. Epley. Yeah. He converted it to an AC um, alternating current generating power plant, mm -hmm. and sold power to New Richmond. So that was one of the first, I mean, that was the first electrical power in the area from the dam. Um, from there, um, there was a lot, of, a lot of kids in the Plurt family. It looks like each time there was anywhere from <laughs> 9 to 11. So they, they multiplied quite quickly. So I just went down the, the specifics that uh, tied right back to, to me and to our family. Um, in 1924, uh, one of the sons was Joseph S., one of Edward's sons. And Joseph S. came to Somerset here in, well, as a 12-year-old. And as a 15-year-old, he was working um, in, one of the in one of Sam Harriman's logging camps. And he was an assistant cook as a young guy. And he worked, I think the head cook was a Campbell, if I remember correctly. But he was an assistant cook. And the cook was one of the highest paid people in the logging camp because you had to have good food to keep the workers. And if I remember correctly, and, I, and I'm not positive, but I think that a logger at that time, so this would have been the 1880s to 1910, somewhere in that time frame, a logger would make about a dollar a day. A cook could make three dollars a day. But they worked round the clock, and there were teams that would go out, and they would get deer, and they'd get whatever they needed to feed the crew. So being a cook in the logging camp, you could make more money. And that's what my great-great-grandfather, as a young man, started to do. And that's where he started to accumulate money, because I know they didn't take it from Canada when they came. <laughs> kind of doubt that. But so anyway, as a young man, he um, worked as an as a assistant cook. And in 1908, let's see, he bought, um, in about 1908, no, it was earlier than that. In, in 1891, <coughs> this would be Joe Plurd, um Sr., my grandpa would be Joe Plurd Jr., <coughs> he bought 80 acres, which is where Roy Plurd lived, out on 64, on the right-hand side. So he bought that property in 1891, and then he got married at the same time. And it sounded like he had a very, very industrious 
a very good business woman as a wife because they said that she was she was phenomenal as far as making you know getting him ahead and, and, and helping him with his business and sound like he has hands in a lot of things then in and things must have been okay in 1908 he remodeled the house to 12 rooms and two porches is what was noted in the history so it was a big house at the time and by that time he had 260 acres So, um, and about 19, let's see, it would have been in the 1915 time frame, um, I heard a story that, that Joseph Sr. sold a load of grain so that Joseph Jr., my grandpa, could go to college. And he went to a college um, in Milwaukee somewhere. I, one of the predecessors, of the name I don't, it doesn't correlate to anything today. But, but anyway, a load of, uh, it's kind of interesting, a load of grain paid for his college that's good. so that it's was a, they even went to college in those days <laughs> yeah well, what, <laughs> what, what it said was that that joseph senior's wife and he were extremely um, pro advocates for education they wanted everybody to get a good education we built our farm house of my farm and you know one thing four hundred dollars yeah, and that's a big house. <laughs> yep. In 1924, or about the, the 1910 to 1920 time frame, there was an implement dealer and a hard goods building down on Main Street, which eventually ended up being the hardware, which would have been blurred hardware mm -hmm. through the yeah, 50s, the 60s, 70s. Did it burn? It burnt down. Burned down. The, the total inside burned out. And then Joe Sr. bought the hardware shell in 1924. And it's interesting because the, the genealogy books that I've got and the Centennial book, I was kind of comparing notes on the two, and I see a little difference in dates. So, Dad, Ed, and Joe owned the, the hardware together. What happened was when Joe, Ju Joe Jr. got out of college and got married, and this is about 1919. Yeah. And you know one thing, Florence, I got to tell you one thing. She was my best, best <coughs> friend you'd ever want to see. Pelican, the second marriage. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And she was a sweetheart. She was a sweetheart. I never forget her. Joel yeah. married a yeah, yeah, gal by the name of Dorothy Pelican. Yeah. Anna just mentioned and they had nine kids and Joe farmed but he had an account he had I think he had an accounting degree he was on the numbers side business side from his college side so he really wanted to be in the business side of it but he ended up being in the farming business and one of the farms that his dad had accumulated was a farm down by Bass Lake which is where Kenny and Arliss and Steve Plurt have if you're making the big round corner by Warman's on the left hand side there was a big farm there my dad actually said one time that he was born what was called the Regan Farm. And I had never heard that before, but there's an old ruins of a house back on that Kenny Clerd property back by one of the ponds, back behind the red barn and back in there. And it was called the Regan Farm, and I've never been able to track that back. <coughs> but anyway, so he decided Joe Plur Jr. was going to farm that property and started building a house. And the, and the shell is still there. If you go around, there's a clump of trees in front of Steve's barn, and there, the house was never built. What happened was, it was the beginning of the Depression, so you're in the 1930 time frame. Um, he had a pile of kids. He needed, obviously, some way to feed all these. I don't know if the farming was all that great in 1930. Anna, you could probably tell us. Bad year farming in 1930? Well, it was dry. It was dry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It was our bootlegging days, 1930. Because <laughs> you couldn't make money farming. <laughs> but, but you know one thing they, they say about the, uh, the plaster man? You know that John Till? Mm -hmm. Well, I'll tell you one thing. John Till healed my um, sister-in-law, and, um, of, um, and um, it was a big, like a... Uh, he took with the uh, 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 pulling plaster, sore yeah. from plaster, yeah. 
as you know, one thing that he did, he, um, they went back and, they, and he said, we went to see the doctor. And the doctor, he said to the doctor, he said, you didn't take it out. He said, I took it out. And he said, you know, one thing, you're not going to get credit for it. <laughs> well, anyway, he started to build this house and the economy was bad. Everything was kind of falling apart from a, from a, from an economic standpoint. And his father said, I'll buy the hardware store and redo that. And you and your brother, Edward, so Joseph Jr. and Edward then moved into the hardware store and started that. Um, it would have been about 1931 time frame, somewhere in there. Um, by 1932, the township tax roll, I think, was about $4,000 is what they collected. And the town treasurer at the time um, lived where where we, where I grew up, where Gerald and Betty bought the farm there. And uh, things were really bad. I think at the time he owned, he owned um, the Sportsman or Lynn's Cafe at the time, too. I think, didn't DeLille own that? I did. I think a guy by the name of DeLille, I think, and I'm not positive on that, owned Lynn's Cafe in the 1930s. Did a guy named DeLille own Lynn's Cafe in 1930s? You know? John, <coughs> we have DeLilles and our relatives, but I don't know, I never heard that. Well, I, Lynn's Cafe? Yeah. yeah, I, yeah. Well, the, well, the story Sportman. goes... Was that the sport? Okay. Yeah. Well, the story goes, bits and pieces of it that I've got, and and pretty much of it's true, but the bits and pieces, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it soft just in case. But uh, in 1932, the town treasurer took the $4,000 and disappeared. <laughs> oh, wow. That's a lot of money. And this was in the middle of the winter. This was in December. And he just left. He, he just was gone. The farm that we grew up on, that, that Gerald and Betty bought, at the time, went into default, went on the sheriff's, on the sheriff's step. Um, there was an emergency town meeting at the hardware store, and my grandpa Joel was there, um, and they determined what they were going to do, and they decided, well, they needed to meet with the, there was actually an underwriter. They had the foresight to have an insurance underwriter on the, the, so the town treasurer was bonded. Good. <laughs> and of the $4,000, they got back about half of it, something like that. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't a total loss. But the guy, had, I think, never showed up. <laughs> the Grandeur store was own, owned by, um, uh, they called it La Grandeur. They had the undertaker in there and everything. Yep. And um, anyway, the deal is that um, uh, they did. They issued credit cards only to the women because the dra the men drank too much. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so anyway, they I I have the she the actually has some of those <laughs> credit cards. Mm -hmm. Well, you better hang on to those. They're probably important. <laughs> I got and they're steel. Yeah, hmm. they are. Well, oh, I have yeah. 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 what uh, what happened? It was interesting. So this is all going on the town treasure thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, the big big deal. And I found that in the old town clerk's books notes, because then my grandpa ended up being the treasurer. Somehow he got drafted <coughs> into it, or volunteered, or raised his hand at the wrong time, or something. I think that at the time it was the only warm place in December was at the hardware <laughs> store to have the meeting. So that may have been how he ended up being defaulted into being the town treasurer. But the group guys got together and they organized it and pulled it back together. Meanwhile, and this is December, it was all, I'm thinking it was like between Christmas and, and New Year's, somewhere in there. And on January 9th of that same year, his wife died. And he had nine kids at home. Um, and she died and uh, had, a, had a baby and the baby died about a month later. So it's kind of interesting when I look through this history and I think, Mike, well, what happened before, the summer before when she was still alive, summer of 32, 
um, when they first moved from Bass Lake to here, um, their house burned down. Their house was up by where Doug Revard's place is, where that, that farm, there was a house there. And, and my dad said it burned, he was just a little kid, and he said it burned totally to the ground. There was nothing left. When they came back, it was, and he said he had pennies in a jar, and they found it, you know, melted into a big chunk. So if you look at it and you think about the challenges at the time, here in, you know, in the summer, they lose the house and everything. Mm -hmm. um, by fall, I mean, they're in a hardware business that's, my guess is that wasn't real profitable at the time, but was getting by. And uh, lost his wife. So all those things were kind of coming together. Um, so hardware business between Joe and Ed then picked up and, and I think did pretty well through the through the 40s. Did your dad and um, <coughs> were they two brothers, your dad and Uncle Joe, did they own the hardware? My grandpa Joe oh, and Ed your grandpa. owned it. Yeah. Okay. They, their dad gave it to them. Okay. Yep. Okay. So Joe Sr. gave two, okay. his two sons, okay. Ed and, and Joe, the hardware store. So they ran that hardware store jointly until Joe died in 1957. Okay. So, anyway, then... David, David you mentioned yeah. um, <coughs> your records reading and that how people come to town that were destitute. Oh, yeah. It, it's interesting. I think that, you know, there's a wealth of knowledge in the clerk's books <coughs> up at the town hall. And it talked about in the 1930s, and that those sections in the and I really was interested in because my my grandfather's handwriting was the most of it. He had beautiful handwriting. I mean, just gorgeous. It looked like the the script that you see in the Constitution type stuff. But uh, when people would come to town and had nothing during the Depression and during the the early 30s and that time frame, they would be given a. They they met with the town <coughs> people, town board people, and they would be inventoried, basically, in the, in the book it says so-and-so came to town and they had two kids and, and they're this age and they came from here and, you know, have nothing, showed up. They would go to, the town would go to Lagranger's store and buy groceries and have a receipt in there, in the book, for $12.80 for groceries for such and such family. So a lot of the family names that came in in the 30s came in and the town helped out. I've got the sales slips from uh, LaGrange's store and my dad had sold a, a lamb and he got four ninety five dollars dressed lamb. Wow. <laughs> then uh, my, um, uh, I don't remember now, uh, there was quite a few different things. It was so cheap that I wouldn't believe it. A suit for a men, dress suit, with a jacket, coat, and vests and everything, and um, uh, they were $12. Well, that was uh, 12 days worth of work. Mm -hmm. 12 days yeah. worth of work. Yeah. They made a dollar a day, so they had to work 12 days. Yeah. The, the other thing that, uh, well, what happened was when these people then got their groceries, um, they would be given work to do in the township. So they would be on the grading crew, on road crews of some kind. So a lot of the roads that were built were by these people that basically just came into town. And the town started out by just giving them, you know, feeding them, and helping them that way, and really gave them a start. One of the records also indicated and showed one of the Somerset farmers had lost a leg in a farm accident. And the town board sat down and worked out and found a doctor uh, and a company in the Twin Cities that would um, manufacture a new prosthetic leg for him. And if you look at the tasks and the types of things that the town board did, they really did a good job taking care of the people in that area because there really was nowhere else to look. There was no, there was no money coming from anywhere else. So they did what they could to help people. So the tax dollars at that time really did, I mean, they stayed locally and they, they, mm -hmm. they were I said, very carefully used to help the people in the community. So I think it really helped build a tight-knit community because, you know, these people all had 
a lot of them had nothing when they came. So, mm -hmm. remember the names? And was... Oh, Harold, I don't. I'd have to go back through. But the, I, there was, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. There's, 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 there's names on there all. Because there, there was a lot of people. There was a lot. All mm -hmm. the little receipts were in there. Um, so that kind of gets us throughout. Actually, and then the tubing started in the 1930s as well. And I think it started, uh, uh, there was the walkathons at the terrace, and that was in the early 30s. And then Dave Bro at the time started putting, renting inner tubes. And my dad, at the time, it was about, I don't know, he was not very old, 10, 12 years old, um, would drive them up with a wagon, hay wagon, and bring people up to, which would have been right below, right below the, the grist mill. Actually, mm -hmm. right below the grist mill, and then they would tube down that little stretch to Myers Park and walk through that. And it was featured in Life magazine um, a couple different times, and I saw one reference here. It was featured in July of 1941, but it was also featured or mentioned in, in uh, 1937. So it's in the newsreel, too. Yeah. We went to Osceola <coughs> to watch it on the news. Yeah? yeah. Wow. <laughs> but I thought it was Donna and Jerry that first went to be. You know, they oh, yeah. just did it on their own. Well, I think and then everybody kind of... I think you know, a lot of people did it on their own. Yeah. In yeah. those days. I yeah. mean, local people. Yeah, the local people did all through yeah. the uh -huh. 50s. Yeah. yeah. Because but we I did. that they were the ones that first started. <laughs> yeah, they're... they're there, yeah. yeah, I do remember that story. There was okay. there was a couple that did it, but from a commercial mm -hmm. standpoint, yeah. as far yeah. as making oh, yeah. money at it commercial and doing it, that would have been Dave Brohl yeah. that started yep. that. Yeah. And, uh, and, and they had a long rope across uh, the river, yep. you know, where the mm -hmm. end was. <laughs> yeah. And if you missed that... <laughs> yeah, and then, then you sat down in the deeper water. Pretty deep, yeah. <laughs> um, the, the tubing then um, ended in 1940 when the war started. Because there weren't any inner tubes, the, the rubber was being recycled, and the availability of you know, people to go do that kind of thing was, was not as great. So the tubing really died off then until the mid-1950s. And then we, 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 was, we tubed Wasn't then. the Terrace nightclub built for $400? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> don't know, Grandma. Don't know. So, the, so commercially, there wasn't really any tubing until, um, well, let's see. The dam was taken out in 1960. Well, actually, my, the, this Epi guy, Epley, Epley from New Richmond, sold the, his grist mill, or sold his power plant grist mill to, and his company was Apple River Power. He sold it to Northern States Power in about 1900. And then Northern States Power built the big power dam that was under the main bridge that was built in 32, um, in 1932, with the, you see the big picture with all the people in it, that was the opening mm -hmm. of the bridge. And that put a huge head of water all the way up, Joyce, all the way up past your place and up the river. Um, you know, all the way to, well, all the way back. It was it was now deep, slow-moving river, absolutely gorgeous. And that dam was taken out in 1960. Northern states abandoned it and took it out, so it dropped all that water down to what it is today. But in 1964, the community and it was Francis Plurd and my dad and some others. Um, were concerned that the water level had gone down so much, you know, you had these big muddy banks and these tree lines way back off in the river. So they petitioned the village and the DNR to build a new dam. So in 1964, they opened up a brand new spillway dam. And the spillway dam, then for 64, was a neat thing to slide down with an inner tube. Mr. Bird and Mr. Westbird were the two that owned the power company at the time. They owned Apple River Power or Apple Northern River States? Apple River Power Company. Okay. Yeah. Well, the spill dam, that was 1964, and we had a flood 
as much as you can have a flood in Somerset, Wisconsin, in 1965. And we worked, and I was, I was there, I remember this. <laughs> Francis Plurd brought plastic home from Doughboy, which for making pools and things like that. Mm -hmm. And what was happening was the sides were made of concrete block. The apron was all poured concrete, so the apron was fine. But the sides were made of concrete block. It was a real low budget dam, <laughs> really low budget. So the money that DNR put in wasn't a lot. So they had these concrete blocks. Well, there were no wings that went into the side of the banks, and they did not anticipate as much water as came down in 1965. So we were down there, and on the would be on the north side, it was starting to wash over the top and get behind the concrete blocks. And I remember Francis and my dad and quite a few people taking these big sheets of plastic and rolling them down and trying to make sandbags to keep the water from going behind the blocks. Well, while we were working on the north side, Joyce's side washed out. <laughs> and it went right around, and the water, it was huge. It was just a phenomenal thing. And I remember watching as the, the, the south side washed out completely, and then it washed... It started washing underneath the spillway dam, and I remember watching the whole apron, oh. at least on the on the south side, totally picked up and flipped right over. Oh wow! And that surge of water went down to the falls and washed out the culvert down there, so it, it opened that wide open. <coughs> and what a mess! It was. It was a mess. It was a dance hall down from Apple River where Sherman Belil lives down there, and they had a dance hall, and we'd go dancing. See, I never heard that. Okay. That was Bulls. 4th of July, Valentine's Day, things like that. And you know one thing, what they, when they had the, they brought something, uh, the, especially Valentine's Day, they had the, uh, the guys would see who was going to bid the highest for the pie or the cake that they had. And uh, one time I had a boyfriend and uh, my dad didn't want me to go with him. He had a beautiful Oldsmobile. And uh, I said to dad, I said, you know one thing? What the heck is that? So I went to stay with Aunt Rose DeLille. She lived out there. And, and uh, so I went dancing with him. So what? after the dam washed out, the, there was a big, you know, a lot of work went back in to try to get the dam repaired and put back. And I think that went on for a couple of years. Meanwhile, what had happened was, is that little narrow spot where the dam washed out was a tremendous rapids <laughs> at the time. Yeah, because was. the river was, think of it, you know, two-thirds of the river was closed off and you had this gushing area. And the interesting thing, the concrete pillars from the original bridge, from this bridge, yeah. were about, I don't know, they're probably four or five feet in diameter and maybe 20 feet long were still there and fell over into that pool area. So not only did you have this high water running through, you had this great rounded um, obstacle underneath giving you this nice smooth area. So the old bridge contributed to the original rapids. And, uh, and I think Harry will remember all the years that we went and, and cut rebar and wire and everything because yeah. all that concrete that broke mm -hmm. up we had to go back in and cut out otherwise people would get hurt. Mm -hmm. And those still are down there, those big <clears throat> those big piers are still there. Yep, and that's mm -hmm. the piers from, from the original the original yeah. bridge mm -hmm. back in the in the eighteen sixties time frame, somewhere in there. You know when they dedicated the bridge in Somerset, there was Lou Montbrine, Eddie Montbrine was the mailman. And then uh Marie Alice, oh, I was a blank. <laughs> we, uh, 
Well, anyway, uh, when they dedicated the bridge, uh, she was picked queen for Somerset. But that, there were three queens with crowns and everything, and they uh, were supposed to. Uh, but uh, uh, there was three of the girls, and they had gold crowns and everything. In when, uh, it looked like the, uh, well actually here, in this picture, you'll see in this picture, this was one of the original pilings right here, yeah. one of the original bridge mm -hmm. pilings. And if you look at it, it's kind of interesting. The inside uh, was, was wood, so they had timbers, and then they had actually put this metal riveted ring around it to reinforce it. And this was one of the, and this right here, that's part of the leftover from the apron in the 19, mm -hmm. uh, from the 1964, 65 uh, washout. So the water came down and went through this open spot to give a lot of, a lot of push through there. And then that was cleaned out because there was so much other concrete and other things in there. Right above the hill was Charlie Parent's house, which is the 100 Parent Street, where the tubing, where Somerset Camp tubing is, where, where we ran for years. And that house goes way back, and we're not sure exactly what the date was of that, but that had to have been easily in the, you know, the early times of Somerset. And then they ran a dairy there as well. Mm -hmm. And that dairy then, Charlie Parent ran. Do you know who was the first one that went down over the bridge? And when they, uh, uh, it was Oral Klucher, grandfather or something like that. He had ender too, and he went over the bridge that uh, He jumped off the bridge? Huh? He jumped off the bridge with the tube? No, I think she's saying he or went or on the went tube on the floating. Yeah. 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 Or old Kutch's grandfather? Well, in, in 1965, when it looked like, 65 time frame, when it looked like the, the dam was not going to be replaced, um, and we had seen how the tubing sliding down the, the hill, uh, the, the apron worked so neat, um, now the river was shallow all the way up. So I remember we had 12 inner tubes, and we stood <laughs> on the corner, which would have been where the stoplights are now, out mm -hmm. in the, right in the very corner. And we rented tubes for, I think, about 25 cents. And I, the first day we opened up, this was in like 1965, 64, that time frame, we made like $12. Wow. That was awesome. Yeah. That was a lot of money back then. And uh, then we, for the next couple of years, we started opening up some campsites on the lower park. Mm -hmm. But the thing that, that's interesting, especially with the, with uh, Somerset's um, special 150 years. When we were cleaning the yard down there, there was a barn, huge big oh. barn. And my dad had used it for, um, there actually had a couple years he had pigs in there. And uh, upstairs in the barn were all of the medicine cabinets from Doc Fineff's um, shop. And I don't know when Doc Fineff died, do you, do you know, Anna, when Dr. Phaneff? When did Dr. Phaneff die? Do you remember? The year? I don't know. Had to have been 40s, late oh, 50s? Oh, yeah, at least 40 something years. Okay, well, anyway, because two things. Well, do you know one thing? <laughs> I was going to tell you. That, Ed, that Anna, Dr. Phaneuf's daughter, she was a wild one. <laughs> <laughs> Grandma, don't go telling stories. No, <laughs> well, well, anyway, Doc Phaneuf's shop, and I'm not even sure where it was. Where was it, Anna? Where was his doctor's office? Where was the doctor's office? Where was Dr. Dr. Phaneuf's office at? Was it there? The dance studio. On the main there. street. Okay, so it would have been where Morris's Cafe? Yeah. Next to uh, yeah. yeah. Next to it Morris's? It was up, uh, okay. Johnny's Tap Room. Johnny's Tap Room. And they say where, where I'm screwed up. There. Okay. Well, okay. All, of the, all of the all the medicine bottles, all full. Wow. A great big pistol and mortar for yeah. crushing up tablets. Mm -hmm. All of the jars. All of 
instruments and tools and all kinds of things and all the glass cabinets that they were in out of oak and glass were all sitting upstairs in this barn. And that was upstairs. Outside the barn was, were, was the covered wagon that was used during the centennial, the Conestoga wagon with the big hoops. And the, the hoops were still on it, the mm -hmm. canvas was gone, and the tires were the, the not tires, but the wheels were kind of getting kind of rotten. But that had only that was, you know, less than you know, it wasn't very many years, mm -hmm. and that was still sitting out parked back up by the barn. Okay. Well, at the time, this is embarrassing, but at the time that stuff didn't seem to be worth anything to anyone for any reason. Yeah, mm -hmm. isn't it? And I remember taking all those fancy glass bottles and that big pistol and mortar and, and medicine bottles with all kinds of dried up stuff and who knows what was in it, you know, and looking at it and we were having a great time. We were filling the old silo, which is in the parking lot, <laughs> see how far we could throw them and break them. So there's a silo in the parking lot there, so sometime if we ever build anything there, we're going to dig the silo out and find all this stuff. But we threw all those bottles in there and then pulled the barn over and had a great big um, great big fancy little big vents up on the top and I remember we mm -hmm. took that off tried to save that and I don't know where that ever ended up but we pulled the barn down and then pushed the covered wagon and everything in and burned it all oh, <laughs> that's sad. oh it's gone but that was 19 that was 1964 65 time frame oh, <laughs> um, yeah we threw a lot of good stuff in the dump can we backtrack a little bit sure. and talk about Gerald and you know what, yep. all the things he did <clears throat> before he got into tubing? Sure. Um, then he was his assistant treasurer. Assistant yeah. treasurer. Well, yeah. Gerald inherited the town treasurer job. My grandpa was the was the chairman for, if I remember correctly, and I tried to find it in the book, I think I saw it somewhere. He was the chairman for the centennial. Uh, the, the centennial planning and all that went on. Mm -hmm. And I can imagine all of the all of the old this had to be just a few of the photographs and these stories that were actually accumulated, and I would love to find where they are. I have no clue, but but he was on the he was the president of the committee at the time. Um, so so Joe was the town treasurer, uh, my grandpa, until about 1952, somewhere in there, mm -hmm. and then Gerald was elected, and Betty was given the town treasurer job. <laughs> so, so he got to go to the meetings and get the paycheck, but she got all the tax, the taxpayers. So from 1952 until 1979, 20 years, Gerald and Betty, at mostly at our kitchen table, collected every dollar's worth of tax roll, unless you unless you mailed it in or went to the town hall or the, which, bank, on or the bank on Saturday. Yeah, and mm -hmm. and I remember. We had all the town meetings. We used to have town meetings throughout that time. And I remember being a little kid and going in the kitchen, and it was full. Our <laughs> kitchen, full of people coming for the town meeting. Mm -hmm. And the smoke was so thick, you couldn't see from one side of the kitchen to the other. <laughs> and everybody was there, and they're figuring out, you know, who's going to do what fence, and what road's got to go in, and who's going to do this, and, you know. And it was grassroots politics at its absolute best. Uh, it was awesome yeah. when you think about it. I'm sure at the time. a smart woman, too. Oh, <laughs> No, but it spoiled every Christmas and New Year's. We sat doing these books because it came all together. We had to do everything right there. And if it was off a penny, Gerald would spend the time looking here, you know. So we always had a plan in our Christmas and over taxes. Yeah. And the clerk's book, and the clerk at the time was Paul Rebart. Yeah. So yeah. Paul, and well, the, the assessor would do his work, mm -hmm. determine the values, mm -hmm. get his books in, and this was all, the timing had been yep. really important, and it was all done manually. There was not one thing that wasn't, was automated, no way. So the, the assessor would get his work done, give it to Paul. Then Paul would go through and calculate all of the taxes, and they had the first calculator that I'd ever seen. It could do, it could do a long division. <laughs> And the thing was almost the size of this table, and they'd carry it around, oh my God. and it was the biggest deal because you could you could divide numbers in it. Sure. So the clerk, he got the, the, the honor of using the calculator with this great big monster, and it would run. He'd punch two numbers in it, and sit there for quite a while, and then come up with a number. So that was the first calculator. Wasn't the, um, the grandeur store uh, the undertaker, too? Fred? Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. All these guys, there was... There was Shea, 
and there was Bill Kress and Joel Plurd and Ali Parnell. I mean, there were, there, were, there were a bunch of names that kept going through that whole time frame. You know, and they just mm -hmm. kept repeating through. And, and in the, if you look in the Centennial book, you'll see their pictures and stuff. You know, those guys were... They were the backbone of the They were. They, they really were. They laid it out. Yep. They made it work. And they made it. They made it all right. happen. Mm -hmm. um, but the uh, the town stuff, you know, every dollar's worth of taxes from fifty two to seventy nine came basically through Gerald and Betty, mm -hmm. and at our dining room table with our two German shepherds at the floor. There was never <laughs> any trouble. <laughs> and, and we'd hear every complaint. Um, and then I think the other funny thing is. Betty didn't really have enough of all the people in the township. She would make sure she got on the census every 10 years so she could go to their house. <laughs> <laughs> and she did. Hey, did you meet at the town hall here? Yes. Yes. Yeah. We, the, in the winter, well, if it wasn't too terrible cold, you'd build a big fire in the pot belly stove, go early, and get the thing warmed up enough that you could actually sit there in the meeting. And. Uh, and I remember as a little kid playing with the World War I German helmet, which is probably up in the new town hall, and a World War I artillery shell. <laughs> and I never did figure out if the, I saw one recently in a museum, and I always wondered if there's a, still powder in that thing. <laughs> somebody brought it back from World War I, and it's an artillery shell that sits about that high and about that big around. And, you know, you put the World War I German helmet on, and run around with this artillery shell in the town hall, you know, I'm surprised the building's still there. Because if that shell was live, well, you were so good. You're still if I even throw it in the stove. <laughs> so I think it's all still up in the new town hall. And if, if it is, somebody should check and see, because it's probably getting a little old. magazines and stuff there. Anyway, we, yeah, that's, that's the 70s. We're not there yet. Um, on the on the town treasure job though that was that was that was really really neat because that was all done by hand and it was it was it was really really something different than anything we can imagine today when people actually sat down and, and talked through issues. Um, they also issued the dog tags mm -hmm. and burning permits. Do that too or not? A little bit. No. No. But. Uh, so then the money would be put in a little green box, which I still have, and, and, and every penny accounted for. And then in 1979, when, when Gerald uh, didn't run again, he ran for the county board and got on the county board. So he got a, a recognition plaque for 27 years, except I didn't see Betty's name anywhere on it. It should have been, should have been Betty's name. Yeah. But uh, the, the politics thing was, was really neat. You know, there's a whole bunch of, the, there could be a whole series of, of going back through the details of that. Um, Were the, uh, the village and the township to, uh, one unit at that time? No. No, the, the to well, the township was the original jurisdiction for all the area. And I don't think the village came into existence until the 1930s as a municipality. And I just, just saw it here, I was going through this, but... Uh, they needed more utilities, they needed more services than the township wanted. So that's why the town building is here, because this that was the original jurisdictional um, facility for, for the area. Um, I remember going through records, and it's interesting, if you, if you dig into it, a lot of the land grants and things were signed by Ulysses S. Grant right after the Civil War. You know, and Sam Harriman's history he, as being a, uh, a military officer, you know, he had exposure, and he was a very distinguished fellow. If you see his picture in the book, you know, this just, just this stunning guy who was a, a general, I guess, at, at the end of the mm -hmm. Civil War. Um, and I read in one place that he actually got to show his troops to Lincoln before Lincoln was, was assassinated. He actually marched his, his troop through. Um, but that was, that, was, that was the hangout for the town guys. And then when the village started and incorporated... Um, you know, the town stayed there. That building was used as a town hall until about 1970. And then the new town hall was built out on the, on the site where it is today. Um, but uh, the old vault in the corner, if you go into the, the, old, the old building, the vault in the corner was, was where all the town records were kept and the clerk's books and everything. They were piled in there with the helmet and the artillery shell. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, what else do you have to, to say about it? Oh, I don't 
don't have much to say. Either. <laughs> well, I was always kept busy with all these things and all these little kids. <laughs> and people used to come to the house no matter what time, <laughs> you know, to pay taxes and stuff. But mm -hmm. we always made it through. <laughs> the money? Did the money ever smell bad? Oh. Yeah, you know who that was. <laughs> there, were, there were some people that brought cash that had been buried in the barnyard. Yeah, oh. bar. yeah. People used to bury it. Yeah. And you could tell. We used came. to bury it in the, the pig thing. Yeah. Pig pen. Pig yeah. Pen. Yeah. Yeah. Those were marked bills. <laughs> and you know what? One time we had a flood and all these jars somehow broke open. All this money was floating around. <laughs> and it did stink. Mm. You can ask Roland about that one. Laundered funds. Yeah, laundered, yeah, laundered and money. pig stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, lots of things have happened. I came in 1953 and moved next to Anna, and Anna was always my good neighbor. Yeah. I always remember. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, always kept busy, and, and I had gone, I was a teacher before, and when I was young, I went to River Falls and thought one year in the country and you got credit for there. For a year, and then I taught for a year in a country school. Had 29 children, all grades. And then I decided to go back to school and I finished my junior year. And then I figured my senior year, all going hit and miss into summer school. Then, then I taught first in in Rhinelander and then Wisconsin Rapids and the last in St. Paul. And then I got married and I didn't have a chance to go back. <laughs> chance. <laughs> And, and Betty was homecoming queen for the oh, Wisconsin River Falls, which okay. was in 1944, right? 1944. When did you play football? <laughs> 60. Well, and I got to tell you a funny story, too, because every time I used to, when I was a little kid, I was known to pout. <laughs> and when I'd sit out and pout on the front step, I would get snapped out of it when, when they'd Mom would tease me and say that I was going to go to Anna's. <laughs> right across the field. I didn't so. that one. He, he said when he was a little kid and he'd pout, Betty always said he was going to, she was going to send him down to see you. You'd give him a good one. <laughs> so, Betty, how many children do you have? Seven children. They Bring them right. Yeah. Have to train them right. <laughs> <laughs> Well, yeah. <coughs> okay, well, that's why I had nine kids, too. Lots of training. Yeah. yeah. That takes us back to the tubing, then, when you began in that in 1960. Uh, actually, we, I think the first dollars we made were in like 1964, before the dam washed out. And then in 65, we started the camping. And then from about 65 to about 70, it just went, it went wild. Yeah. And I remember in 1970, and this would have been in high school, and we had... Gosh, probably half the guys that I played football with, and Harold was one of the coaches, and they all worked for us down the park. We had 25 employees, <sighs> Betty, and would would make dinner and supper for our whole crew every oh, weekend, yeah, every day, well, every day, every day yep. we worked. Yep. And we had our first bus was like a was a '56 Chevy, and during the flower era of the 60s. We had great big daisies on the outside of it. It was painted that. white and it had red and yeah. yellow and all kinds of daisies on it. Yeah. And we did get those. They were hard to get off in the 70s, but we did. <laughs> and I got to drive bus for hauling tubers up in our park along the river when I was 12 years old. So they'd all climb yeah. on. They'd, they'd laugh. They'd say, you know, do you have a bus license? <laughs> they didn't know I didn't, didn't have a license, period. <laughs> but we all did. And I, every one of us did. We didn't know at the time there wasn't such a thing, at least in today's terminology, liability insurance didn't exist. <laughs> we didn't know what that was. Yeah. And so we didn't ask, and nobody said. <laughs> and also on licensing, we never licensed the bus because it was stayed on our property, mm -hmm. never went anywhere. Yeah. And I think we didn't even have insurance on the bus <laughs> internally because it's on our property, and we right, thought at the time, if, yeah. yeah. So all of, all of the kids in my family, all of us, drove that old '56 bus hauling tubers. But Harold did too, didn't you? Harold did too. <laughs> it, had, it had no power steering. <laughs> at that time, <clears throat> when the river's edge started, then people would walk back. And it was a real problem because hundreds of people would be walking back on 64 carrying tubes. Mm -hmm. 
And then Milton, I believe, started yep. the busing. Mm -hmm. And everybody put their people on the bus and took them out. And yep. you had your own busing. Yeah. What, what, what happened was you know, the tubing, by 1970, were thousands of people. It, 30,000 people on a weekend was not uncommon, <coughs> which meant that you could not get, you couldn't drive from here to the river's edge. You, you couldn't drive through. It was solid people. And they'd walk right down the road. The ditches were full. Um, it was it, nothing like we've ever seen in the last you could walk years. across from where I live to the other side of the bank, and you'd mm -hmm. never get the water. Yep. Yep. It was <laughs> solid. Yeah. It was. It was. It was. It was. Going it was down there that one Sunday it. when they estimated thirty thousand people, everybody had sold out of tubes, mm -hmm. and it was like army ants. You had to wait <laughs> to <laughs> jump in. Mm -hmm. Solid tubes. It was yeah. just well, insane. But that's fast. Mm -hmm. There was a couple things that were interesting back then, and I didn't grab. I don't think I grabbed the right magazine. Maybe I did. I did. Okay. <laughs> Woo. This, this is interesting. This is a little difference in why do things change? Why is the Apple River different today than it was in 1970? And you know, we, we tried to study why is that difference and, and why, why do we have a business at all here and what makes this unique and how can we grow it and, and make it work right as it should and so on. And it was interesting. Um, in 1970, um, Valley Fair didn't exist. That's right. There were no water parks. Water parks didn't exist. The Minnesota Twins at the time would have maybe 4,000 people at most in attendance at a game. So the people didn't do that. Um, the Apple River, because it was close enough to the Twin Cities, was always kind of the place to go. Mm -hmm. And it was for all, we had as many kids, and we'd have church groups, we'd have 15, 20 buses. And they would mingle into this, and there, there really wasn't any problems throughout the throughout the 70s and throughout the 80s. So you got you know a 20 year time frame in there. Um, and people at the time, I think, in a lot of ways, were a lot more tolerant. It was different, and they weren't maybe as quite as as I don't know, maybe edgy as they are today. They, was, they weren't. A, they weren't. It was a different. Because I'll yep. show you a picture. Definitely here's, different. Here's Life magazine, and I'll show mm -hmm. you a picture that that's really interesting. Today you look at it, and your immediate reaction is is probably not positive. But back then, Life magazine put it on, and everybody, Life magazine did positive things. Mm -hmm. This was not a shock tabloid. This was <laughs> this was central what everybody liked and everybody mm -hmm. would do. Well, Life magazine um, and National Geographic too. Matter of fact, I spent three days on the river with National Geographic who ended up, Bill Allen, who ended up being, I think he's the president of National Geographic today, mm -hmm. spent three days taking pictures on the river and I spent three days with him. It was awesome. He took thousands of pictures and they've got a huge archive of, of stuff back then. But it, for that, it was kind of this Americana type thing. It was neat and it was acceptable and it was fun. Mm -hmm. And that included how people drank at the time, surprisingly. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was there, it was almost like it was more acceptable the way people did things then, today. Because look at the pictures today of what you see. Yeah. Those are our tubes, by the way. It says Somerset Camp across <laughs> the <laughs> so We rented those. But anyway, you know, the initial... I was, I was featured in Life magazine, but not on that one. Is that you, Anna? <laughs> <laughs> are you the one with the wine bottle? <laughs> I think it's the, the red bathing suit one. I, I, I want to look at this one. I think it's red probably this one. But what happened was 1970, um, people got along better. Everything mixed. Mm -hmm. There wasn't the extremes that you see today. You know, today, the, the things that we fought through the, the early 90s on the river were the drugs and the, the, the wild sex type stuff. Yeah. And it was totally out of control. And that was, at the time, that would have been. I think managed on the river. People would not have let that happen. And it just kind of got away. The other thing that happened was there are so many dollars for recreation in the Twin City area. And when Valley Fair opened up, we saw a difference. When the Twins went to 20,000 people, we saw a difference. Other water parks opened up. Well, the Mall of America alone. Look sure. at that. Sure. Yeah, so so what so you much. did was you took all of the, you know, it was not the only place to go anymore. Mm -hmm. So people had a choice. And we always compared it because there were seven different tubing families that ran the tubing business. And we were just one of the seven. And I always compared it like having one ski hill and seven different tow ropes from yeah. run by different people. Mm -hmm. So not everybody 
had the same idea of what the business should look like. So we had a lot of struggles through, you know, should it be drinking, mm -hmm. should it not be drinking, how do you manage it, how do you control it, and, and we went through years of... Yeah. of years in uh, four times. That's a yep. good picture. That's yep. quite a good picture. So you want to look at the pictures. So we, we ran the tubing business, our family, uh, the Somerset Camp tubing business from about 1964 until about four years ago, and four years ago. So we ran the tubing business from about our family, ever, and that was that was our mandatory job from early spring to get everything ready until Labor Day, and then to get everything wrapped up for every year from about 1965 until um, just a few years ago. That must be for a lot of trips, family trips, then. <laughs> <laughs> we far between. Yeah. We never in the busy. summer. We never went anywhere in the summer. But oh. but we all dealt with people. Um, everybody in my family, all all seven of us kids, and we all mm -hmm. got to spend. You know, we learned how to do business basically, mm -hmm. and uh, essentially you, you negotiate with every car that came in to try to figure out. You know, do you have to give a tube away for a little kid or something? Yeah. But you did that for all the years. Um, we even had the governor of Minnesota one day. Um, we had uh, put the can targets in place, and this was kind of interesting because of the, the litter problem. We actually had permits to build a grate for on the river to catch all the cans so they wouldn't go down to the, the, the power dam. And we had a permit for it. We tested it. We built some samples and things like that. And during that, we had alternatives. We built the can targets, and I think Gerald came up with the can target idea. So we put four posts in the ground and a, and a mesh around the back and then had a big target on it said can target and each one was numbered from the top to the bottom. I think there were 20 or something like that. And then we started having this very strange medical phenomena. And your, the right finger on throwing arm, the end of the fingertip would get cut off. Stuck it in the hole. Every day, people would take these cans and to throw them, they'd fill them with water because they could throw them farther. Whether they could or not didn't make any difference, but they'd fill them with water, put their hand on the, their finger on the back, and it had water. So they plug and they'd throw it, and the can would cut the end of the finger right off. Well, I remember one day I was patching up somebody, and at the time, you know, you didn't worry about band aids and blood and all that other stuff. It was wash it off and keep going. But uh, I was patching somebody up, and the governor of Minnesota <laughs> pulled up in a car, and he came over. And he had to see what was going on, and we went through all this. So he was going to check. I didn't. Th I think he still thought he was in Minnesota. But, <laughs> but uh, you know, I I have a paper, and it said my picture is on there. And it said if Bush can make the headline, I can too. And I was on the paper on the same kind of paper. <laughs> So how did you clean out those can targets? Um, they just, you you go around with the truck and you can shovel them out. Yeah. 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 They actually work, work pretty good. Yeah. Um, people like them. But, you know, but then as, as time went on, those full beer cans that people would throw didn't hit the can targets. They'd hit other people in the river. <laughs> so then, then you started treating head injuries from yeah. getting hit in the head with cans. And then a lot of them continued downriver, and the people on the St. Croix would complain. Yeah. And uh, the real... Bad thing was the invention of styrofoam. No, yeah. <laughs> all that styrofoam no. would break, and they're just like ants going down river. Yeah. Pieces of styrofoam, mm -hmm. and everything was in there was gone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Throughout so, the week, interesting. Early on, the tubing thing was set up because the Boy Scouts got involved. I think in the late '60s. Yeah. On the tubing Fifty set. cents a tube. Fifty cents mm -hmm. a tube. And the early tubing prices were generally you paid a dollar and a half, mm -hmm. and when you brought the tube back, you got a dollar back. Mm -hmm. So we ran through more one dollar bills out of this bank in Somerset, then, you know, you'd, we'd go get, on a, on a Friday, you'd get a stack, you'd get a, 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 a thousand $1 bills. Because that's what you'd go through if you had a, if you had a good weekend. Because people would give you whatever, and everyone, you had to give them a dollar back. And then it kind of got to the point where you were given a dollar back for tubes that you never rented. Oh. <laughs> so some days you'd end up with more tubes than you had. And if they were good tubes, that was probably okay. Yeah. But from a business standpoint, we, we changed that in the 70s and went the driver's license, got rid of the deposit. But, uh, and in the 80s it went to about three bucks, the 90s, six bucks. Today you're probably playing 12 to 14. Is it, Gerald? Yeah, is it? Yeah. yeah. I don't know. Oh, see, I don't know. I haven't gone 14 so, years. Everything's going up. Yeah. Do you have any questions you'd like to ask David or Betty? Very interesting.
through skin. Yeah. 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 Covered a lot of ground. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Has changed Tell a lot. Tell us about your family. You just said you have seven children. Where are they? And All right, my family. This is David the oldest, and he works for Laser. Then next is Debbie. She's married to Donald Wishard. She's a nurse, works in Stillwater. Yeah. Then is Cindy, and she was a teacher, and she lives between here and Richmond now. And then it's Danny, he works Northern States in gas. And then it's Douglas, he works for Emation. Your husband does too. And then it's uh, Melinda, she has a yarn and bead shop in Stillwater. And then Roger lives down in Iowa. So I didn't get married until I was 28 and I, I caught up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I always had a job to do. So we always we always had a job, and Gerald, there was never a downtime. We weren't, and we always had cattle. And uh, the other thing, Gerald ran, is interesting, and I, I just found this out when, when Harold and Betty and I were talking on Monday, because um, I knew my dad ran for assembly in 1960, but I didn't know that Warren Knowles... Came out and asked him to run. And Warren Knowles, was, was he the governor at the time? Uh, I think so. No, maybe he wasn't the governor at the time, it was before. But anyway, Warren Knowles had asked Gerald to run for assembly, wow. and he ran against a guy by the name of Bill Ward. Okay. And Bill Ward, a, a yeah. lawyer from Richmond, had, and he won the election. Bill Ward won. Yeah. But uh, that thing happened too, and part of the, the uh, Joe Plurd bought the farm in the 1934 time frame from the courthouse steps where we, where we grew up and lived out on the I. And then Gerald and Betty bought that in about 53. No, yeah, a little later. Somewhere in that time frame. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, Gerald farmed, was a dairy farmer, and he built the big barn that's there uh, in 1940. He said they were building the barn, they were in the basement, or they were hauling out sand and things when Pearl Harbor happened. So that would have been. That was um, 41, 41. Mm -hmm. December 7th. Yep, so they were doing that during that time. <coughs> he had 12 dairy cows through high school that he had, and uh, his dad didn't want him to get the dairy cows and wouldn't loan him any money for it, so he went to Allie Parnell, and he borrowed the money from Allie Parnell and bought the cows, and I guess when my grandpa found out, he was really mad, and I'm not sure why, but <laughs> anyway, so that's what, he started the dairy, started dairy, <laughs> and then he farmed dairy cows until... 1960, and then Gerald and Betty were in a car accident in St. Paul in 1960, and Gerald hurt his back. And um, another car had, had run into us, and uh, the at the time, you know, insurance was all different and everything, but they did send him to Mayo Clinic to for treatment, and they did a back fusion. And this was about the time he was running for office as well, so he was kind of kind of hobbled, kind of crippled up, but. Uh, so they did a back fusion on one side where they take the chunk of hip and they fuse it in. Back and this is 1960, so this is pretty pretty new stuff. Mm -hmm. It didn't work, uh, but they wouldn't do the surgery until Gerald brought the bill of sale for the dairy cows because <laughs> the the doctor in Rochester at Mayo said he said I know dairy farmers and I will not do the surgery unless you sell the cows because if you don't sell the cows. You're going to be you're going to be working with them, and this won't work. Yeah. It's just won't work. You got to you got to be rest for a year. Oh, okay. So on March, on St. Patrick's Day, 1960, we had the auction, and we sold the dairy cows. And I remember that I cried. My cow yeah. got sold. Into the snow. No, it wasn't so on that day. Oh, we did. Oh. No, that day, but we had the auction, and I remember our bull had a little a little little St. Patrick's thing on its tail. <laughs> I remember that. I went and cried because my cow went to But anyway, we, then we got dairy cows. So he, he beef cheated. Cattle. Beef cattle. Yeah. Beef cattle, mm -hmm. sorry. Got beef cattle. Yeah. And then, uh, um, so we had beef. Warren Knowles, governor from 65 to 71. So this would have been before. Yeah. But, uh, so anyway, so that was the end of the dairy business at, at Plurd Farm. Yep, and who helped me out when Gerald was in Rochester the second time? Anna, if you want to stay with me. <laughs> so, so, Betty, what do you do now that you're not uh, running the town or running a business? Well, I'm just living up being lazy. <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah. Question back there? Yeah, um, when, when I cross the river there, by the bank, there's a big sign that I think it says Sunset Brown yeah. or something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Was that your yeah. business yeah. that it's referring to? Yeah. And does the business still exist? Well, no. We still own the property, but we we part we decided not to participate in the way the Apple River is run today, and the, and the way it's managed. Yeah. I see. So we four or five years ago decided we would not rent a tube and not do camping. It you can't manage it right now. You know, law enforcement has decided not to do anything about it. I know one thing Betty did that wasn't at her. Uh, kitchen table was be an election judge for many years. Oh yes, I worked up, and then I, it was two or three years. I worked at vocational school. I taught basic education in the evening. And citizenship. And yeah, and I had how many get citizenship? Vietnamese, two Vietnamese girls, and and Korean and stuff. That was really interesting. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, no more questions, and we'll end it on that. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Thank you. Oh man, I tell you.